The Gospels indicate that Jesus' mother and family thought that Jesus was out of his mind. Why would his mother and family think he was crazy if an angel appeared to her to inform her that Jesus was the Son of God? That is completely whack. I cannot wait to hear well, this. Could you imagine? We I think this is our eighty fourth show together, eighty four shows, and I don't. And for some reason, uh, no one's ever asked this question, and I was uh, waiting for a question like this to come in. Uh, the the question is that um, if you look at the Synoptic Gospels, and particularly interested in the Book of Mark, in Mark chapter three. Uh, mid-chapter, we're told uh, Jesus assigns the who are the 12 disciples. Immediately, so you have the list of the 12 disciples, and immediately following that, Jesus is, is traveling now. He's an, not only an itinerant preacher, but he's an itinerant healer. But what's key is that when we get to chapter 3, verse 2, 20, Jesus is in this house that's really all, all um, there's just a huge crowd that's gathered. And we are told in the book of Mark, and it's specifically in Mark chapter 3, verse 21, that when his family, his mother, his brothers, uh, get wind of the fact that uh, her son, uh, their, their brother, is running around doing this, they think, they said literally that he is out of his mind. And they right away wanted to get him out of that situation. We find a similar story in Matthew 12 and in Luke 8, where they send someone in to let Jesus know that your family is outside wanting to speak to you. Your mother, your brothers are wanting to speak to you. The stage is set now. Jesus' family believes that he is not well, and he clearly is not who people, well, kind of think he is. And uh, because in the book of Mark, it's, it, no one is really clear who Jesus is until we get a little further on in the book. And uh, Jesus, of course, realizes that his family is not going to be they're not going to be his followers. But his true family are his disciples. And he actually turns to them. He looked at those who were around him and he said to them, here is my mother, here are my brethren. At the end of the text, he says, whoever does the will of God, this is my brother, this is my sister, these, this is my true mother. Okay? We have this very similar text in Matthew, a similar, very similar text in um, in Luke chapter 8, verse 19, 20, and 21, 22, although Matthew, as, as it would be, Matthew would always improve Mark a little bit, so it would remove that he's out of his mind part. So, now, this is a, a theme that runs through uh, the God. We even find it in, uh, we find in the Gospels that, you know, a prophet is, you know, is not without honor except from his own countrymen, which is a double negative, meaning that his own people, his own family here, don't accept him, don't recognize him, but outsiders certainly do, you know. And now, there is a, a not just a question to be asked here, it's a, um, it's a blazing question. And the blazing question is, is how is it possible that Jesus' mother, namely Mary, thinks that her son is out of her, his mind? Wasn't she informed? And when in his, before he was even conceived in the book of Luke, Luke's infancy narrative, specifically the Annunciation with the angel. The angel Gabriel came to Mary and let her know that she is going to conceive. Mary says, I've never been with a man, and, and the angel Gabriel then, it's just a very elaborate infancy narrative, says, explain to her that the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and you will name, call him Jesus, and, uh, and because the Holy Spirit is coming upon you, therefore, he will be the Son of God. 
So the same Mary, she knows that she is a virgin when she conceived with Jesus in her womb. In, in, in case she possibly could have for, forgotten that, which is, I'm not going to say it's inconceivable, because it's obviously ridiculous. Um, we have Elizabeth, who's her cousin, who too was having difficulty having a child. She's the mother of John the Baptist in the book of Luke. This is unique to the book of Luke. Uh, John the Baptist and Jesus are first cousins. Um, um, they're, they're, they're cousins. So what happened, So Mary and Elizabeth are cousins. And, and the key point is that l l the Holy Spirit descends on Elizabeth, and she also uh, informs Mary that, uh, that in her womb is the Savior. And if, if that's not enough, you, you go to the infancy narrative in Luke. Again, the infancy narrative in Luke is something we can, we can just keep going to because it's enormous. There are only two infancy narratives in the entire Christian canon, uh, Matthew and Luke. The, the infancy narrative in Luke is enormous. It's in fact, just that infancy narrative alone is larger than some books in the Christian Bible. In chapter 2, verse 17, you have... Uh, the shepherds who were out at night and have an, an, an angel appears to them, informing them that the Messiah has been born, tells them where to go, and they in fact go to the home. They go to the, to the it was essentially a, a barn in the book of Luke, and uh, Jesus, is, the little baby is there, and they bring gifts, and again, they reaffirm it. So there's no way Mary could have had you know, f could have thought that her son was ill. I mean, the, she's been informed over and over and over again. She'll be told by Simeon this. So repeatedly she is informed that she had conceived with the, ho with the Holy Spirit. She had conceived and had given birth to the Messiah, to the Lord Jesus Christ. So the question, of course that doesn't jive with the book of Mark at all. Why would she think that he's out of his mind. Why would the family? I mean, if anybody knew, I mean, there's only really one person who can be absolutely sure that she was, uh, that Mary was a virgin when she had conceived with Jesus, and that's Mary. I mean, no one, no one could know that better than her. So, what's going on here? Why is Jesus saying, look, the ones who are following you, that's you that are around me, and you are my true family, meaning you are my mother, you are my brother, you are my sisters. What's happening here? So, of course, the story... Now, if you take Mark and Loan, if there wasn't... Uh, uh, if there wasn't, were not the other two synoptic gospels. Once we get to John, everything changes here as well. I'm not going to go there, but if we look at two synoptic gospels, so it, it doesn't work as it won't. Obviously, this won't jive with Luke, but it works well with Mark. Mark is a very interesting gospel. When I say interesting, is that the Mark essentially is it, it's frequently referred to as a passion narrative with an introduction. Mark begins by telling us that this is uh, this is the gospel of Jesus. This is what's called the Incipit. Uh, this is the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of Son of God. And but for the first eight chapters, that means halfway through the book, no person, no human being, has any idea who Jesus is. No one knows who he is. It's very intriguing until chapter 8 and then Peter gets it. So the key point is is that the Marks, the way Mark is shaping the story is just no one knows who Jesus is. No one can figure out who he is until we're right before the crucifixion, right, right as we're approaching the Passion Era. No one is still sure what he's doing, what his precise role is. And then what, ha what happens at the end of Mark in chapter 15 specifically the way Mark sort of ends is that the Roman soldier finally gets it. And not any Roman soldier, but a centurion. For those who don't know what that would mean, what that would imply, what that would convey is a centurion wasn't just a Roman soldier. A centurion is, um, was it a very high official, a, 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 just not like a soldier, but he would be like a, like a, I don't know. He wouldn't be quite a general, but he would be a major. He'd be someone who would have to be 
very well trained, not a young man, someone who's... And the centurion, as Jesus uh, dies on the cross, gets down and says that, behold, uh, this was the Son of God. So that's the way Mark is is shaped, that no one gets it, but the key point is that the non-Jew at the end, the Roman centurion, he gets it at the end. Now, there are others who get it between 8 and, but it really is, it's it's that full picture between Mark 1.1. 1, 1. So, therefore, this story can work in the book of Mark. The only thing we can be absolutely certain is that Mark never read, read Luke or Matthew, <laughs> because Mark is written first. The book of Mark is written, let's say, about the year 6570. Luke and Matthew are written about 15 years later. They're improving on the book of Mark, but the improvement makes it impossible for uh, the story in Mark to make any sense. So they're going to repeat the story over again, again, that Jesus is is healing, he's drawing a huge crowd, uh, the disciples have already been assigned, his family are standing without, meaning they're sitting outside the house asking someone to go to Jesus and say, you know, the, his, their family, uh, we, we'd like to talk to you. And they're trying to get him out. And Jesus is turning to his disciples and going, Behold, you know, you're my family, you're my mother, you're my sister, you're my brother. So we find that, that Mark's words almost verbatim in Matthew and Luke. And of course, it, it doesn't work. It can't, it doesn't work because the big question is why would Mary not know who? Why would she think her son is out of his mind? Mary knows she's been informed directly. And it's not like when she was informed in the book of in Luke's passion, in Luke's infancy narrative, she's going, nah, no, it's, she knows it, and Elizabeth knows it, the whole Mishpacha knows it. So so here again we we, we find something that is 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 of course doesn't work. But what I'd like you the viewer to think about is not to go, ah, we have here a something preposterous or something torturous in the Gospels. That's not the way to look at this. Rather, what I walk, what I think the best way, the best way to examine this, rather, these striking stories that are inconsistent with each other is that the way we can see now how the Gospels are constantly improving upon each other, how as far as Paul goes, Paul is not even mentioning infancy, he's anything that's not of no importance. Galatians 4.4, 4, Jesus is just the son of a woman, period. Uh, in the book of Mark, we only introduce to Jesus as an adult at his baptism. Again, if he only becomes the son of God at his baptism, and that's how it present, that's what we're presented with in the book of Mark, of course his family might not know. In fact, nobody knows. Nobody go knows until we get halfway through the book. Matthew and Luke are going to, both are very familiar with the book of Mark, because almost all of the book of Mark appears in Luke and Matthew, but they're going to improve upon it. But while they're improving upon it and adding a lot more information, information that's unique to Luke, uh, unique to Matthew, and some material that they both share, which is called Q, we now see how the Gospels are shaped. And of course, what's important is not, you know, is not to uh, is is not necessarily to take apart the Christian Bible. What we want to know is is the Christian Bible a book that one can depend on? Is this the Word of God? Is this divinely inspired? Do these stories make sense? We're not talking about a little contradiction of who was at the tomb, which women were at the tomb, exactly what time they arrived, did they arrive before the stone was rolled away, not. Those are interesting. They're very interesting. But here we have a family, including the mother, who thinks that Jesus is out of his mind. Why would she think he's out of his mind if the infancy narrative that we are, that comes into view in the book of Luke is accurate? That would be impossible. Mary is informed over and over and over again that she, she will conceive with the Son of God, with the Messiah. She, ha she then is informed when she's already pregnant. She is informed after she is born, birth, over and over and over again. These two are not consistent. The Christian Bible 
Therefore, the credibility of the Christian Bible collapses, and with it uh, collapses the fundamental core doctrine of Christianity. Thank <laughs> you. 